our challenge, said the late Ernest Boyer, president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, is to affirm the nation's schools and to continue the struggle to achieve excellence for all children, not just the most advantaged. The Yale New Haven Teachers Institute was founded in 1978 to address that challenge, and since 1979 it has been offering seminars both in the humanities and in the sciences. Fellows in the Institute pursue in these seminars a course of reading and prepare individual curriculum units for use in the classroom during the following year. The university faculty provide important resources, an up-to-date understanding of a special field and sustained guidance in the preparation of the units. But the curriculum units are generated and designed by the teachers themselves. And the Institute has always insisted on the principle of collegiality. Seminar leaders and fellows bring to their discussions different but equally valuable kinds of knowledge and experience. Ernest Boyer has said, rarely does a school-college collaboration get to the heart of the matter, helping teachers and advancing the quality of education. The Yale New Haven Teacher Project is a dramatic exception to this rule. What's really important about uh, the Teachers Institute is that, first, it, put it puts teachers and teaching at the center of school reform. Every city that's larger than New Haven and probably very, very many which are smaller than New Haven ought to have the very same kind of arrangement between uh, the liberal arts faculty of uh, one or more of its key universities and uh, the public school system. Uh, this kind of transfer of knowledge and learning back and forth between the teachers and professors uh, is a missing ingredient in every school system. So it really is a national model. In recent years, with the help of grants from the DeWitt Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and many private donors, the Teachers Institute has become the first program of its type to be permanently endowed as a unit of a university. It is concerned with the achievement of students of all ages and levels of ability. Its fellows, too, are a diverse group with varied preparation, teaching a wide range of subjects in elementary, middle, and high school. Each year brings a new crop of fellows, though many return over the years to take yet other seminars. Gita Z. Wilder of the Educational Testing Service found that fellows credit the Institute with enhancing their interest in the subjects they teach, increasing their engagement with teaching, and augmenting their senses of autonomy in the classrooms. The Institute, said Ernest Boyer, brings the resources of the university to teachers in the schools in a way that recognizes their own professional stature. It is leading the way, he said, to improve teaching and education. How has the Teachers Institute managed to lead the way for two decades? It is a complex organization with a director, James R. Vivian, who maintains close relations with New Haven teachers, with the Yale University faculty, with the superintendent of schools, Reginald Mayo, and his staff, and with the president of Yale, Richard Levin, and his administrative officers. Under Vivian's direction, the institute is sustained at the grassroots, however, by the school teachers themselves. Each year, the fellows' body of representatives surveys the teachers in their various schools to determine the areas in which they would like seminars to be offered. James Vivian then recruits Yale faculty members to offer seminars on topics within those areas. Very helpful in this process are fellows like Jean Sutherland, who have had several years' experience in the Institute. Jean was active in promoting the inclusion of elementary school teachers in the Institute. Like I envision coming into seminars with high school and um, middle school teachers who had majored in these various er areas and that I would feel out of place and uh, not have that much to contribute and uh, that was far from the truth. Since then, Jean has participated annually and has served as the Institute representative for her school and a member of the steering committee. Last year, she was part of a team from Beecher Elementary School, 
who found in a poetry seminar with Professor Paul Fry that they could use poetry as the basis for studying colonial American, Mexican, Japanese, and African American culture. They hadn't initially thought of using poetry as a means of, of communicating the qualities of these cultures. Uh, uh, they ended by doing so, uh, and I think that as they proceeded, they realized that poetry could easily be the, the, the real focus of their unit. Uh, poetry about these cultures, but of course also poetry by persons within the cultures, children as well as adults. Their curriculum units culminated in a smorgasbord of culture that teachers, children, administrators, and parents found extraordinarily moving. If we do it together, we don't have to do it forever. Living on Carmel Street, I'll always remember those days. Those poems, they were good. They were great. I mean, some were funny, some really struck well, how we live in our neighborhoods. In January, after the seminar proposals have been approved by the representatives and ratified by the University Advisory Committee, they are presented to teachers in the New Haven system. At an open house, interested teachers meet with the seminar leaders. Those who apply are reviewed by their schools to ensure that their curriculum units will fit in with the school plans and goals. The seminars begin in March. Each seminar includes teachers in elementary, middle, and high schools, one of whom will serve as its coordinator. The coordinators are crucial to the Institute's successful operation. Representing the schools in the Institute and the Institute in the schools, they remove the seminar leader from a hierarchical position and so help to establish genuine collegiality. Each seminar leader provides a plan for common reading and discussion that can serve as the matrix within which the teachers will develop their curriculum units. The focus that I chose was what are the most significant problems in current thinking in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, and that requires essentially that I cover uh, in broad strokes all of the field, at least what the thinking is, what the uh, concepts uh, uh, used are, uh, how to use the tool of mathematics and the, and for quantitative reasoning, etc. I mean, the main thing is that the issues of race and representation was a, was a kind of urgent, urgent question for me, and I think uh, something that has a certain kind of urgency to, to the people in public schools because their students are seeing it all the time. Professor Charles Musser is leading a seminar on race and representation in American cinema, which will consider work by the early African-American filmmaker Oscar Michaud, the Disney film Pocahontas, some documentary films, and such recent films as Mississippi what Burning. It? It's like saying, no, this, is, this is how the lynching actually, this is, this is how the, the murder actually occurred. This seminar on multiculturalism and the law um, digs deeper <laughs> into the personal identities of actually everyone in the room in a way that I kind of anticipated, but now that I'm into it is, is almost surprising to me. My son's an honor student. My son is a wonderful child, but because he wears black skin, the reality is that before he reaches adulthood, he will be stopped for some trivial something Someone could take my child out of here. There has been a kind of level of trust amongst ourselves and frankness and openness um, that has just been, uh, as I say, quite marvelous. The challenge for each fellow is to develop a curriculum unit that relates to the seminar topic and is also appropriate to a specific classroom. Luis Recalde, who was born in South America, is pursuing a doctoral degree in Latin American culture while teaching in elementary school. Now in the astronomy seminar, he will develop his unit in collaboration with a colleague, Victor Leger, who teaches art. It will um, be a great contribution of, of, of great benefit in my school and in my classroom because um, we integrate the subject matter 
in, uh, in the classroom, mathematics, science, social studies, language. Steve Broker, a leader in the early effort to organize science offerings in the Institute, is also in the astronomy seminar. The unit which I'm uh, proposing and planning to follow through on with the Teachers Institute is a unit that I'm calling the interplay between astronomy and ecology. Ida Hickerson, who is from North Carolina, has been a representative and a member of the steering committee and is now on a state committee on standards in history and social studies. She is in the film seminar. My topic is Mosaic America in American film, fact versus fiction. For instance, that new movie uh, that Walt Disney's brought out, Pocahontas. There are a lot of factual information in, that is, has been included in that uh, animated uh, video, but then there's also a lot of untruths in that video. And I want my students to be able to look at it from that point of view. In the early seminar meetings in March and April, the Yale faculty have outlined the common reading and study but those outlines are revised and often expanded by the group as they proceed. A series of talks is offered to all the fellows by current or prospective seminar leaders on subjects of broad interest. Margretta Seashore, professor of genetics and pediatrics, who is leading a seminar on genetics in the 21st century, speaks about current issues in genetics. And you have this double helix that uh, a strand and an anti-parallel strand that is complementary to it. And the best analogy that I've heard to that uh, is like the uh, curlicue cord on the telephone. And so you have the, the stretch of foam cord, but then you have it all curled up. And then if you were to twist that again into a tertiary shape, during this period, the fellows also work with their seminar leader on a prospectus and a preliminary bibliography. Weekly seminar meetings begin in May, and the fellows start working on the first drafts of their curriculum units. Take the solar system. You start like, you know, with whatever is around at home. The Earth is at home, but to me it seems that it's really the, the solar system is at home now you know, the technology that we have. And for that, I have uh, one of my um, colleagues, uh, Mr. Legere, <laughs> and he came up with an idea of uh, creating a solar system in New Haven. The yes. fellows often find opportunities to try out the units with their current classes. Mr. Legere, yes. shall we say that probably is about 15, 10 to 15 billion years old? The our galaxy is closer to 10 billion years old. The universe is closer to 15. What's the name of our galaxy? In Espanol, what is Spanish, La Via Lactea, which is Latin, right? Via Lactea, the Milky Way. Luis Ricaldi had earlier focused on the Aztec civilization in a seminar on architecture with Professor Kent Bloomer. He now links the Aztec calendar with the study of the solar system. This is the wheel of the stars, the Shikuato, the wheel of fire. See the two snakes here? Quetzalcoatl means the twin. Look at the twin. Or the feather snake. Look at the snake and the feathers. Look at the feathers. Feathers of fire. And that's what Calderon is doing over there. After the first drafts are completed, they are discussed in the seminars. I'm hopeful of using the Peabody Museum of Natural History, uh, which has a tremendous collection of meteorites, as, a, one, of, as one of my lesson activities. And in this scale, uh, the sun will be four meters in uh, diameter. And that we have in our school already hoisted, and all the planets are there. This is an extra planet that we have. So this is in my classroom, and we keep it in an inclination, so it will be really nice like that. Now this one is flat, but they know this will be, this is a sun, because it's a star, the shape of a star. Three sticks, you know, with a hexagonal there, uh, six sides, and then we just build it around it, and it really flies nice. These drafts are also discussed in individual conferences before the fellows start on second drafts, 
that uh, will include well, lesson the, the plans and annotated if bibliography. You can identify some instruments. And your question when you were um, writing comments on uh -huh. my paper to me was, am I concerned with misrepresentation of history or stereotypes? I'm concerned with both. During the summer, the seminar leaders meet with James Vivian to discuss the seminars and the curriculum units. The chance to revise, to reflect not only on uh, the actual teaching, but on the content of a seminar so that it's really reflected in the curriculum um, is, um, is an issue that I think is an important one for us. That's always an issue, isn't it, in uh, work like this where the curriculum unit is in fact begun before one has moved very deeply into the common reading and discussion of the seminar, so that in, in, in one sense their ideas ought to be continually transforming themselves in the course of this sequence, and yet they are early on committed to a certain framework for the curriculum unit. We can do much more good by taking someone who really is limited in knowledge and approach and making him or her uh, an adequate teacher than we are taking someone who's really outstanding and giving a pat in the back and make another step. But it is, in a way, anomalous in mean, the effort of the Institute to be inclusive of everyone who teaches in New Haven uh, is very different than the approach of the institution to be exclusive <coughs> in its admissions of its own right. students and that creates, it seems to me, a very different teaching situation for you than you customarily have in your own teaching at Yale. Right. There's a problem with your approach. We've had in our seminar, though. It came to kind of an interesting head in, in my seminar. I don't think they would mind sharing this, where one of the people at this particular end asked a question, and one of the people at this particular end sort of lost it and said, you're always asking questions that I don't even understand the question, let alone the answer and you're, you're making this seminar at a level that I can't understand. Mm -hmm. And once that person said that, then the whole group sort of got together and said, oh, let's talk about this problem. How can we solve this and meet everyone's needs? And it was actually a very good and useful discussion, I think. Uh, the person over here heard that she was, in fact, kind of driving things in a direction that others couldn't understand. But then the person over here found that, that uh, over here is where it was. And that meant that she was going to have to do a little bit more work to, to kind of uh, to come up a little bit more than where she was. At the end of July, the fellows submit their completed curriculum units, which are then published in volumes, placed in school libraries, and made available on the internet. An updated index is also made available each year. Though first taught by its creator, perhaps in expanded form, a unit may later be used in part or as a whole by many other teachers. Steve Broker, whose unit deals with the relation of astronomical events to life on Earth, brought his class to the Peabody Museum. A major topic for the students is the devastating effect of meteorites upon prehistoric life. Look at the exhibit displays look at the specimens of meteorites and at the information that is given to you about these meteorites and then refer to the questions that I pose to you and see if you can come up with some responses to those questions. As asteroids are compared to this. They're just uh, regular like rock, like uh, you see? Um, you see rocks. Let's, uh, let's start with what you've written about comets. Ida Hickerson's unit deals with the question of fact and fiction in two films, Pocahontas, which students are comparing with Jean Fritz's biography, The Double Life of Pocahontas, and Mississippi Burning, which they are comparing with Mildred Walter's historical account in Mississippi Challenge. Those three young men were killed during the civil rights, early civil rights movement when they were registering people to vote in Mississippi. These students are seventh graders. Most of them do not have a background of the civil rights. Most of them really don't know that period. They didn't live it. And it seems as if somehow or another they have missed some of that history. So therefore they're having to be retaught the history through me and they're reading a very difficult book 
that's really not on the seventh grade level, it's more on the eighth or ninth grade level, but they're struggling. They're going, they're coming to the media center as a group, and they're working with the librarian, the media specialist, and they're going on internet and trying to pull up any information about that time in Mississippi when those three young men were killed or assassinated. And their job is to come up with an oral report that explains that period and actually what happened and how the video, Mississippi Burning, is completely or slightly different than the way it really was. But like many teachers, Ida Hickerson has continued to develop her unit after the seminar was over. She has now added a section on Jackie Robinson, after whom her school is named. Students are making a diorama, writing poems and a play about Robinson's life, and turning that play into a film that is based upon fact rather than fiction. For the teachers and their students, these units have been informative and exciting additions to the curriculum. I found that my students were more animated. They were more expressive in their opinions after we finished the unit. They were able to critique constructively. They also benefited from it by being able to do activities such as projecting themselves in a writer's viewpoint. How would you write history? How do you be inclusive of facts and also make sure that you don't distort the fact by what you believe or what you think is happening? My students developed a good sense of current events and the unfolding of science from day to day. We were dealing with very current hot topics that made a great deal of splash in the newspapers and on, in the media. And uh, I think they felt that they were somewhat of a part of that unfolding process of discovery. Um, I thought that was very interesting because you get to see what's going, uh, what's currently going on that you couldn't necessarily get from a book, or get from somewhere because it's, uh, it's something that new that's just now happening. So you get a chance to um, go on the internet and see what scientists at NASA or wherever, what they're doing now, how their um, experiments are going, and you get a, like a first-hand um, view of like what's currently going on before they finish it. You got, you can like see things in like progress. I think if I could tell you an idea, it would be summarized by one word, renaissance. Because the students were able to do a myriad of activities in art, in literature, science, architecture, uh, archaeology. We included Mexico. There was a group of students who did Mexico in design. Some others were doing uh, aerodynamics with kites. The other students were doing some uh, uh, calendar from Mexico also, and then we had the Galaxy Project and the Solar System, and we were able to coordinate all those activities in a wheel of work. And I think that that's a Renaissance activity. If the science teacher asks us, um, what do you know about light? What um, the speed of light? How does the light travel? Then I know the speed of light that is 300,000 kilometers per second. Mathematics was very important in my unit because my students started to, we addressed the, the standards of mathematics of the level that we deal with, fifth, sixth grade, and uh, scientific notation, uh, coefficients, working with big numbers, astronomical numbers, and also because these numbers lend themselves to apply, to be applied to the dinosaur age and what happened with the meteors and the dinosaurs, and how do you really come across to the student to realize and visualize what it is to have 65 million years. How do you do that? Now, let's see, if a teacher of science told me about how the distance from, um, let's see, from the Earth to the next star, I could use a scientific notation too because the numbers are big. But now, I use scientific notation to put, like you said, the big numbers in my pocket make them little and understand the numbers so I don't get screwed up with the big numbers. What would you do if you didn't have the time? teachers we have followed through the institute year have benefited along with their students. Their success is an important response to needs that exist across the nation. The public schools need to involve both new and experienced teachers in professional development. 
to attract and retain minorities in teaching, to provide teachers at many levels with more background for teaching science and other subjects, and to retain well-qualified teachers in the sciences and in other fields. The Yale faculty who participate in the Institute are committed to these goals, and they also find many other benefits. The best way of uh, reaching a large audience in a meaningful way with a uh, protracted period of time is through uh, teachers. If you teach teachers, there is the leveraging effect. The teachers are the ones who will reach a very large audience. And in that regard, it's a unique opportunity to do, to give back to society what society gives us. The, the exchange uh, was, uh, I thought, uh, not only intellectually meaningful, but also deep at a personal uh, level. Uh, it was a, a mutual uh, process of discovery and, and, and self-discovery in reading uh, uh, these uh, Latin American texts that we were uh, dealing with. There was, it was really a, an exciting experience. And one of the things that I've found is that it gives me, I've, got, I've had much more hands-on ideas about how to work with even Yale undergraduates. Part of what happens in the exchange between Yale faculty and New Haven teachers is our ability to, uh, to suggest alternatives to a curriculum that still needs to be built up and established. I think there's a lot of scholarship that goes on the university about multicultural issues, minority culture in society, a literary traditions that haven't yet made their ways into standard textbook form. Being a pediatrician and taking care of a lot of children, I uh, have a lot of concerns about what kids need to know if they're going to grow up and, and be uh, functional adults. And I see them facing a lot of issues where better knowledge of, uh, of science and genetics would serve them well. And of course the key to that is their, is their teachers and their schools. First of all, the contact with the teachers. I, uh, I enjoy that tremendously. I have great admiration for them. They are doing very, very difficult work. Um, and uh, their dedication uh, is just immensely impressive to me. And one of the things that I feel is that I am making a contribution within the capacity that I have to uh, the public education system in the New Haven Public Schools. Indeed, as Superintendent Mayo recognizes, the Teachers Institute is important for the New Haven school system as a whole. Um, I'm hoping that you know, we will have a Teachers Institute that's taking a major lead and role um, in developing curriculum and developing um, leadership um, in, in the school district. They have done things on an individual basis that can be transferred to a district-wide level. I think there are some things that we're trying to do of a systemic nature. Um, and certainly these people can be great internal leaders for us. Many of the Institute fellows have been um, extremely helpful to others, to their peers in the system. Uh, many of them are now assistant principals, principals, curriculum developers. I was an Institute fellow as well, and the, the opportunities were just um, so wonderful because to be in a setting where you're learning and where you're interacting with each other and then to bring that back to a classroom, to bring that back to your peers and your buildings uh, is something that we all should want to be a part of. Right now in New Haven, we have a curriculum framework document. I see the Institute now moving to another level. There's so many wonderful units out there, but now those units can really serve as meat to this curriculum framework document, can put some meat on the bone, if you will. I think this is a great opportunity to really uh, allow curriculum to live. I think the, uh, the Yale New Haven Teachers Institute is one of the most important models uh, that uh, needs to be observed uh, and perhaps even replicated uh, in the nation. 
uh, of a, uh, an effort that is clearly working at the, at the right level, i.e. improved achievement and, uh, and learning are all outgrowths of improved teaching. And real reform, uh, whether we're talking about standards or, uh, uh, or whatever, will take place at the classroom level through improved teaching and learning. The Yale New Haven Institute captures all of that. And it's sort of a, uh, in one city, a microcosm of what could go on in many cities. And the quality of what uh, happens in this marriage between a great university and, uh, and a school system that has many problems, but also obviously many possibilities, should be looked at very carefully. The Institute program is one of the most important examples in this country of a powerful relationship between a university and a school district. The core of the Institute is the faculty relationship between the university faculty and the school faculty. That relationship simply does not exist most places. It is very powerful. It is absolutely essential for improving American education. The work of the Institute can certainly be replicated in other settings, in other universities and school districts. They won't do it exactly the same way, but the core element, which is to bring the faculties of the two sets of institutions together, can certainly be replicated, and we ought to be encouraging it for every university and college across the country. What would it take for other cities to adapt the approach of the Yale New Haven Institute to their own circumstances? They would have to think carefully about the needs of their own school district and about the resources of local colleges and universities. They would have to begin talks across institutional boundaries, and they should be prepared to give important responsibilities and initiatives to the school teachers themselves. As with the Yale New Haven Institute in 1978, there should be a school superintendent and a college or university president or chancellor who are committed to founding such an institute. There should be teachers who are eager to participate in the process of designing and sustaining it. And at the heart of their collaborative enterprise, there should be a continuing director who can relate to this diverse constituency. It has to be someone who does understand uh, where faculty are coming from and also has a perspective on the, uh, on the issues that are involved in, in public school teaching. You, you need a combination of a high patience for detail, diplomatic capacity, willingness to sit through endless meetings, it seems to me, and then also ability to raise funds and you know, be kind of a, a visionary voice to the outside. For two decades, the Yale New Haven Teachers Institute has proven its value for the schools of this city. As a professional, it has allowed me to look at curriculum, to see that curriculum cannot be just focused on one particular subject, that you've got to make sure that you're interdisciplinary when you plan your curriculum or your subject that you're going to teach. It also has prepared me to be able to use other resources, to network with other people. The full, to ask other people about different things and to ask them to help me with some resources that I can use with my students. It has also helped me to grow as a professional. I've developed the ability and the confidence that I can plan a curriculum, that I can go out and get materials that my students would be able to use in the classroom. Mister, uh -huh. what, what happened with Venus? Venus is gone. Teachers have discovered new energy and renewed commitment to teaching. They have expanded their intellectual horizons. They have revised and expanded their curricular offerings. They have brought new enthusiasm to their classes. The Institute provides a model of university school collaboration that can be adapted for use throughout the nation. Every school system, of course, has its own needs and every university and college can offer a distinctive array of resources. If those needs and those resources are taken into account, a university school collaborative can adapt the Yale New Haven model to its own unique situation. And a nationwide network of such collaboratives would constitute a major step 
toward the revitalizing of American education. I think they learn how to look at the sky and think more about themselves. I think that's a very good thing that astronomy gives us. You know, because we are like the staff of the stars. We were the staff of the stars and we are the staff of the stars. How many stars? Billions and billions, 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 billions. How many stars in our solar system? Ten. Thank you. Who Ten. said one? Jonathan? Me. Augustine? Yeah, me. How many planets in our solar Ten. system? Nine. 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 Somebody, Ten. one person named the biggest. The sun. The, sun. Sun. the biggest planet. Which one? Somebody named the smallest. Pluto. Which one is the farthest? Pluto. Which one is the closest to the sun? Mercury. Thank you. What's the name of our planet? Earth. Earth. Thank you. 